Let's try to solve one of these air resistance problems. So let's say you're driving in your car and you start with some initial speed V0 at T equals zero. So you take your foot off the gas at time T equals zero and at that moment you're traveling at the speed V naught. What's gonna happen? You're gonna slow down because if nothing else, there's gonna be a force of air resistance. You're gonna be running into all of this air that you're pushing out of the way. It's gonna push back on you. You're gonna slow down, you're, even if your foot is off the gas, you're not gonna be coasting at constant speed. And at some later time, you're gonna have some velocity at a time t. And that's what I wanna to try to figure out. What is an expression for the velocity of this car at some later time t if its initial speed was v naught at t equals zero? So you slow down, there's gonna be a force of air resistance on you, we can call that the drag force. And let's assume for this problem that we're going slow enough that this equation up here is a decent approximation to what the air resistance would be. So let's say the air resistance is accurately described by negative a constant that would just have to do with things like the density of the air and the shape of the car times the velocity of the car. Given all this information, we wanna figure out what is the velocity of the car at some later time t. So I want a function, I want a velocity as a function of time. How do we get it? Well, the first thing we do, we draw a force diagram. I already drew that over here. You've got your drag force left. You've got a normal force up and a gravitational force down. That normal force cancels the gravitational force, so they don't really bother us. And I've just got the drag force left, so our foot is off the gas. And I'm neglecting friction here. To keep things simple, let's say the only resistive force on this car is due to this drag force right here. So now we'll do what we always do. We'll go to Newton's second law, which says that the acceleration in a given direction is equal to the net force in that direction divided by the mass. And the direction we care about is the horizontal direction, because if I want to know the velocity in the horizontal direction as a function of time, I'd better relate the horizontal forces to the horizontal acceleration. So I'll label that with an X and forces with an X. So what do I get? What are the forces in the horizontal direction? There's only one. There's just this drag force in the horizontal direction. And that's given by this formula up here, negative B times V. And then we divide by the mass. So this might not seem so bad. You might be wondering why did this, why does everyone make such a big deal about solving air resistance problems? This equation doesn't look that bad. Why does this require calculus? Well, think about it. The reason this is weird is that this drag force depends on the velocity. That's unlike these other forces. Think about the force of gravity. This does not depend on the velocity. Force of gravity depends on the mass of the car and the gravitational constant near Earth, 9.8. Those are just constants. They don't change based on what the velocity is. But this air resistance force will change. Why is that weird? Well, think about it this way. So as this car coasts forward, it's gonna slow down. So this velocity is gonna decrease. But since the air resistance depends on the velocity, as that velocity decreases, it decreases the amount of air resistance. But through Newton's second law, the amount of force, which is the air resistance here, is gonna determine what happens to the acceleration. So as that air resistance decreases, that decreases the acceleration. But we know acceleration is the change in velocity over change in time. So as this acceleration decreases, that changes the amount the velocity is going to be in the next moment. And that new velocity is gonna determine what the new air resistance is gonna be, which determines the acceleration, which determines how the velocity changes. And you get this feedback loop that at first glance seems impossible to deal with. How are you gonna ever nail anything down if as you change one thing, it changes the next, which continues on through? Well, the way you deal with it is with calculus. So this is why, even though this equation doesn't look so bad, you're gonna have to use calculus. And what you always do is you write this as a differential equation, i.e. we're gonna have to put a derivative in here. And the place the derivative goes is where this acceleration is because we know that the acceleration is defined to be the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. And I can say that this whole thing equals this whole right-hand side right here. So now what do we do? Well, we're gonna separate this derivative. So this really is a fraction. It's saying that a small change in velocity over a small change in time is gonna equal this ratio of negative b v over m. So I'm gonna multiply both sides by dt, which effectively just brings that dt over to the other side. So I'm gonna take this dt, multiply both sides by dt. Now I don't need this anymore. And so at this point you might be like, well, the small change in velocity dv over this time interval dt is just gonna equal negative bv over m times dt. So you might be like, shoot, 
let's just integrate both sides, eh? We could just add up all of this. That should equal all of that. There's a problem, though. Look at there's a hidden v in here. This v is a function of time. We don't know what it is. You could do this integral if you knew what v was as a function of time, but that's the whole goal of this problem. If we already knew what v was as a function of time, we could have just wrote it down from the get-go. We don't know what it is as a function of time. So if I wanted to do this integral, I could pull the b and the m out because they're constants, but the v is changing. I don't know how to do this integral with respect to time if I don't know what the function of v is. So you might be like, shoot, this is hopeless. What are we going to do? Here's what we do. I've got a dv sitting on this left-hand side. So I'm going to take this v and move it over with its buddy, its other v on this side. And the reason that helps, so I'm going to divide both sides by v. And what I'm going to get then is dv divided by v is going to equal negative b divided by the mass times dt. And you might wonder how that's any better, but here's the deal. Now I can integrate both sides. Look at what happens. If I integrate both sides, this right-hand side is dt, but b is a constant and mass is a constant. So this integral is easy. I'm not going to have any function of time in here at all. And this v that was the troublemaker, it was a troublemaker because we didn't know what v is as a function of time. But I do know what v is as a function of v. This left-hand side is an integral with respect to v. And the function of v with respect to v is just v. It's just like having dx over x. Now I've got this on a side where I can do this integral. It's the same as just having integral of, say, 1 over x dx. And that integral we can do. In fact, that's a logarithm. So moving this over, this is called separation of variables. You separate all the v variables on one side. You put all the t variables on the other. The reason is, I don't know what v is as a function of time, but I do, want it, I do know what it is as a function of v, so this becomes doable. This left-hand side is going to be a logarithm. This right-hand side would just be some constant times t, and then I can make progress. But before we move on, let's put some limits in here. So t should go from time t equals 0. So this would be t equals 0 to some time t because I want to know what the velocity is at time t. And v should go from, I'm integrating this left-hand side with respect to v. The initial v is just v naught. That was the velocity at time t equals 0 to whatever the velocity is at this time t. So we're going to get whatever the velocity is at, not multiplied by. This is at time t right here. OK, so now we can do these integrals. The left-hand side, not too bad. The integral of 1 over x with respect to x, hopefully you remember it. Um, integral of 1 over x dx is just natural logarithm of x. So if you forgot, look it up in an integral table or go watch the calculus videos that derive this, but I'm going to assume you already know this. The integral of 1 over v with respect to v then would just be log of v. And it's going to be evaluated between v naught and v as a function of time t. So v, the value of v at time t. And this whole thing's going to equal, well, the right-hand side, this integral is really easy. Negative b over m is a constant. I can pull that out, and I get the integral of dt. But the integral of dt is just t. So this is just going to be negative b divided by m multiplied by t. And it's going to be evaluated between 0 and t. And so we'll just continue this up here. What do I get for this logarithm? I get log of v, and I'll just let just know that if I write v, this is v at time t. So I'm plugging in this v at time t there, minus log of v naught, so the log of the initial velocity. And that's going to have to equal this whole right-hand side, which is really just going to be negative b over m times t. Because if I plug in t, I get negative b t over m. And if I plug in 0, I'm just going to get 0. So I just get this. So what do we do at this point? We might be lost in the math. What I want is v. So I need to fish this v out of here. And the way I'm going to do it, first I'm going to note that, all right, a difference in logarithms, maybe you remember this rule. This one's useful. If I have log of a minus log of b, I can rewrite that as the logarithm of the ratio of a over b. So this is a handy logarithm rule that I'm going to use right here. I'm going to say that this is the same as log of v and I really mean v at time t, divided by v naught, the initial velocity. That whole thing's got to equal negative b over m times t. And I do that because I want to fish this v out, and the way I do that is by getting rid of the logarithm. 
and I can get rid of this logarithm by doing e to both sides. So in other words, imagine taking e to this whole left-hand side, and then e to this whole right-hand side. That equality should still hold, but when I take e to a logarithm, it just cancels the logarithm and I get whatever's in this parentheses. So I'm gonna have v over v naught is gonna equal e to the negative b over m times t. So I'm gonna get e to the negative b over m multiplied by t. And now the last step, all I have to do, I wanna find v as a function of time, so I just multiply both sides by v naught. And I'm gonna get that the velocity as a function of time, I'm just solving for this v, which was always v at time t. It's gonna equal the initial velocity the car had, v naught, times e raised to the negative b over m times t. This is our velocity as a function of time. So we got it. This is the velocity of the car as a function of time, and this makes sense. If you imagine graphing this, let's make a little graph right here. If we put time on this axis, and we put velocity on this axis, we're gonna start with some velocity v naught. So the car would start with some velocity v naught, and then it gets small, it gets slower and slower, right? It dies out. That's what e to the negative t is gonna look like. It's gonna just die out and eventually asymptote at the t axis. So it would look something like this. So this car dies out, gets slower and slower, looks like a negative decaying exponential, which makes sense because this car slows down as it moves through the air. So recapping, you set up these problems by using Newton's second law as always. You can't naively integrate both sides until you've moved this velocity to the other side with dv because that velocity is a function of time t. But once you've separated variables, you have all velocities on one side and times on the other, you can integrate both sides and solve for the velocity to get what the velocity of the object is as a function of time t.